Hello, everyone. David Young here, host of the Drone to 1K podcast. Welcome to season five, episode five. You're going to really enjoy today's show if you want to know about drones and agriculture. Today, we're going to be on with Grant Puckrin. He is a farmer who's worked on a farm for a lot of his life and got into drones and is combining the two. So you're going to hear a lot of stuff about crop spraying, agriculture analysis, all that fun stuff if you're into agriculture and how it works with drones. So looking forward to getting that convo. A few quick things before we dive in. Like always, if you want some free swag or potentially a free course, click on the link around this video or click the link in the email you got the podcast alert for. Uh, answer one question about today's show and potentially win some cool free stuff. We like to give away things to listeners of the show that are like really on top of it. So this is only good for the first week that the show is out. And then once we release the next show, we'll announce those winners and have a little game for the next one. So get in on that. If you want a free t-shirt, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Just be honest with it. Let's take a screenshot of it, send it to us. David at Drone Launch Academy and Jorge, J-O-R-G-E at DroneLaunchAcademy.com. And we'll send you a shirt as a thank you for taking the time to leave a review. Anything else? Let's see. Oh yeah. Our Drone Launch Connect community. Go to DroneLaunchConnect.com. We started a membership community there. You get big discounts on drones. If you're thinking about buying a drone, you get access to community events. So we do like happy hour hangouts online. And I think the coolest thing is we bring in experts to talk to you, let you come on screen, talk to them, ask your questions. Um, if you don't have questions, you can listen to other people ask questions or Dusty, our community manager, can talk about the areas of their expertise. So we usually get people from the podcast now to come on there. And actually Grant is going to be one of our expert Q&A folks. So he's going to come on the podcast. I'm sorry, he's on the podcast this show. He's going to come into the community and you can talk with him there if you're a member. So it's just $1 to get started right now. I think we're going to close it at the end of August. So if you're listening to this and it's before the end of August, you are uh, still good to go. So dronelaunchconnect.com, check it out. But otherwise, enjoy the podcast today and I'll see you in there. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Drone to 1K podcast. Uh, I'm David Young. I'm here with Grant Puckerin. Thanks for being on the podcast, Grant. Thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, and so Grant's business is called 19th UAS Precision. I had to make sure I practiced that one to get it right. Um, but yeah, stoked to have you on the podcast. You're coming at us uh, from Ohio today, right? Correct, yep. And I was making you jealous. I was making you jealous because I'm sitting here in like 70 degree weather in the woods in North Carolina on a short little trip, but I will be going back to Florida where it's like a billion degrees and then I'll be jealous of you in Ohio at that point. So I'm sure. It's actually supposed to hit like 110 here next week. Which no. -uh. Is, yeah. Yeah. For like two days. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah. I take that back. Maybe I won't be jealous. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but anyways, let's dive into some drones. I try not to find out too much about our podcast guests before interviewing them. So I don't, you know, have to ask the same questions a bunch over, try to make it or an organic conversation. Um, but why don't you just start, start off telling us, uh, how you got into drones in the first place. So usually I like to start there. For sure. So I actually got started looking into drones. I was always interested in aviation. Um, you know, did the whole report on the white, the white brothers, the first airplane, all that. Um, but I actually got really into drones in 2020. I had a lot of extra free time. Um, okay. like, hmm, what could I do to educate myself and possibly, you know, do something on the side or maybe in the future full time? Yeah. Um, so my first drone was a Mavic Air 2. Um, okay. I bought that, got certified, um, and then flew around just mainly for fun for most of that year. Um, I studied in the winter, uh, so December 2020, for the Part 107. I got that in February of 21. Okay. And then I took the business full time, um, and since then I've added in a Mavic Air 2S, Mavic 2 Zoom, and then I just bought a DJI Agris T30, along with a Phantom 4 RTK multi-spectral. Oh, dude, you racked up. <laughs> yeah, I... I Grew, scaled up quite quickly. That's awesome. Tell me about the yeah. um the t what was it the Agris? Yeah, the Agris or Ag Agris, however they pronounce it. Is that a that's not a, is that the sprayer drone? That's a sprayer drone, correct? Oh yeah. man, those things are pretty big. Don't those things cost a ton of money? 
about 30k is what that oh my was. gosh yes. well we're gonna have to get we're gonna have to talk about some of this all yeah. right so so the very beginning so 2020 so you were started you get into drones 2020 2021 yeah. you got licensed and and kind of dove in uh talk about that like how did you get started yeah so um i went to college for web development and graphic design so for me, it was natural to progress into real estate, creative photography, aerial videography, and that market. Um, I, I started doing that. I got in with a few agencies um, and, you know, was doing pretty good. I was doing about four to six shoots a week, roughly. Um, okay. For just now, were you working out, for your, were you working? Yeah. Were you working for yourself at this point, or are you like subcontracting for someone else? Or? Only for myself. Okay. So I was doing pretty good. Um, still kind of knocking down, you know, knocking doors, mm -hmm. um, marketing myself and selling the business. Um, and then about, I would say, late fall of 21, I've been like, hmm, there, there was, there's more to drones than just like, um, the creative aspect, which there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. That's a great point to sell markets via for drone services. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, what could I do that would help other companies and industries more so? Right. Um, and where would they, where would the value be the most, um, most benefit too for both parties? So along with going to college for graphic design, web development. I was raised on a farm. I still farm. Um, our family farms about a thousand acres. Oh, cool. Yeah. So what kind of stuff do you guys have on the farm? Uh, we do row crops and then we do sweet corn. We've, we've been farming there since 1838. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So we go back quite a ways. Wow. Um, when you say row crops, what are row crops? So that would be like field corn, soybeans, wheat. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. So in the, Fall, I would say the fall of 21, um, I was, you know, doing some market research, trying to figure out where the market stood for agriculture or just general aerial mapping in this mm -hmm. area. Um, and then slightly beyond that. So with my background in farming, um, my experience with drones a little yeah. bit, I just, it, it was a natural push I felt to that market um mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so so you were doing work in real estate and then you right. you know had the had the hey what can i do what what more can i do so let's dive in first to the some of the real estate stuff sure um so how I, I still do that to this day oh, okay i am using um i'm actually i hired on another pro seven pilot to do that Oh, to handle the real estate stuff. Yeah, to cool. Free up more time. Yep. So, so for the people who are interested in real estate, maybe let's let's dive into some of your story there, and then sure. we can transition to over some of the agriculture stuff because I definitely sure. know people are going to be interested in hearing about that too. Yeah. Um. So with real estate, you know, we've had a lot of people on the podcast that have done real estate too because yeah. kind of a natural starting point, like you were you're telling me before. Um. But what was your strategy for working with real estate agents? Were you just walking into brokerages or calling people? What What was your kind of your initial way you were getting clients um so initially i was doing that i was going into broker agencies um you know i'd hand out like a folder with information about me the company and the benefits of using you know drones for real estate photography and how it yeah. you know sticks out to people because we see so much content a day now on our mobile devices that if you have something even the slight that is slightly different from the rest of it, it's going to help that person to stop and see. Oh, this is this is a gorgeous estate. Um, so I started doing that. I, you know, knocked on doors, did cold calls. That's never fun. Um, <laughs> a couple did develop with that. Um, oh yeah, you got some landed from cold calls. Some. Okay. Out of the many I you know, sure did. That's um, pretty typical, probably though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's to be expected. So and then, you had like a whole, you, so you had like a whole package, like a marketing package, when you walked in there. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that helped too because I had my experience in uh, web development design. So marketing yeah. just kind of, to me, it's it's separate, but it's 
part of that. Yeah. Um, kind of like a crossover between both industries. So yeah. I kind of had that knowledge. Um, I did a lot of public speaking in high school and college. So that helped a lot um, okay. to try and sell the service. And then I did a couple freebies um, that helped get me into a couple um, agencies who I do work for. Oh, I'd say I, I do a good amount for them um, just by doing those freebies, you know, and then to just as long as the realtor's okay with it, ask them if you can post it. That way people can see your work. And even if you're trying to get like your part 107 and your trust, well, trust certified now, it wasn't a thing two years ago. But yeah. if you're trust certified, go ahead and fly, post pictures. You know, if you have a basic logo, put that logo on there so they can, you can start building some brand recognition. Um, and then I try to sell the realtors like, videography but i feel that's kind of hit or miss depending on the realtor themselves because okay. they can't post it in the mls oh, okay um, i have a couple of realtors that do like interior videography like a home walkthrough they they enjoy yep. that but i think it just comes down to all personal preference yeah now when you're offering these services for uh these realtors are you doing interior photography and drone photography and, and everything, or are you just doing drone stuff? Right. So I started solely doing drones. Um, I would, you know, do highlight, like I'd fly to like 110, highlight the perimeter and the property surrounding the house, mm -hmm. get kind of closer, do that. Um, then I'd do a top down shoot to show like the overall size of the property. And I did at mainly aerial, aerial exteriors for, gosh, eight months before I mm. started offering interiors. Gotcha. Because there was nobody in the area per se that um, at that time that was doing aerial real estate, there yeah. were a lot of interior photographers. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of realtors already had someone. So it was like an add-on package, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then just back in February, I started doing um, a lot of interiors. And in all honesty, I used my Pixel 6 Pro and a DJI gimbal. Oh. And that's exactly what I use. So. Dude, nice. So you just use your nice cell phone camera, grab those interior shots, and then use your drone for the outside? Right. Correct. Nice. And then, you know, I don't uh, know how much you want to talk about pricing. People always love to hear, you know, pricing, but – and it changes, I know, by area. But what would you charge for right. – you know, interior photos and just some drone photos for a typical real estate job. So for a typical real estate, um, aerial and interior package, I do 235. Um, okay. Now, if it's a one story home with basement, that's usually about 30 minutes, give or take, depending okay. on the layout. Two stories, about an hour. Um, it depends too on how many angles you take or what the sure. client wants. So about 235 then, you know, you'll finish out in the exterior with the um, drone, do the surrounding areas, shoot those. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, do you um, do you do you do your own editing on the photos, or do you outsource that, or what are you what are you doing there? So I still do all my own editing on the photos. I'm working on hiring somebody that can do that, along with some basic graphic design stuff, simply because I'm running out of time during the day if <laughs> yeah. that makes sense no yeah um, for sure so yeah that where my background is from college web development design i had all that experience to do all my editing video production color correction for photos i had all that experience so that's kind of what started me in real estate but now i have the experience so i just don't have the time yeah. so I, i'll probably be outsourcing here within the month that's the um, classic business growth dilemma, right? Just going from one person. Yeah. And then once you've maxed out your time, you got to figure out how to get other people on the team to right. leverage their time too to, you know, grow the business while still keeping everything profitable. It's always exactly. a balance. <laughs> it, it is a, it's a very tough balance. And it's been yeah. like that for the past three months, which is great. It's, yeah. It's yeah, a great it, problem. Sure. Um, especially when you hear about all the stuff in the news, but all these, I mean, right now we're filming this June, 2022. I just feel like every time you hear any news source, they're just like, oh, stocks are down, you know, recession this, recession that. So to be like, I've just got so much work 
uh, I need to, you know, more people. Uh, you're in a yeah, I mean, think. that's what's so nice about it too. I'm growing a business and it allows me not help just my clients, but it's helping allowing me to employ others who maybe need a part-time yeah. job or yeah. potentially a full-time job, which yeah, it's no, just, great. it's so great that you get yeah. to help so many different people. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, you build this real estate thing. How many, how many real estate jobs do you think you were doing on average? Kind of, let's say like, I don't know, a week or a month or kind of what was your volume like? Obviously enough. When to I was do just started. Time, right? I guess you're getting, getting started and just recently, like, you know, obviously it seems to be enough to support you full time, but just curious, you know, for other people, they can, they always want to know how busy people get. Right. So, um, I started off doing maybe two to three exteriors a month. Um, mm-hmm. just cause it was so new in the market. I don't know what about anywhere else in the country, but the real estate market was so hot that realtors were at a point where they didn't need to take the extra time or money to get the aerials Yeah, because it was, they were selling so quick. Now yeah. I'm doing almost six to eight a week. Um, so and that's inside and outside, right? It depends. I, there's still some that I only do exterior. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Or my pilot does exterior. Yeah. Sure. So it, it depends too. And um, yeah, so started off kind of slow. Did a couple of those were freebies the first couple months. Um, those kind of turned into one freebie turned into two paid shoots. And yeah. Realtors talks just, just like farmers do. Um, so that's if you do good work and you treat them well, they're going to tell other realtors. So Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. So built the real estate side up and you were thinking about getting into agriculture. How did you go from having a Mavic Air 2, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, that's probably what, like an $800 drone or something, give or take? Or $800, yeah. Yeah. And then if you you know, batteries and stuff, you know, maybe like a thousand, some like, you know, barely, maybe barely over a thousand with batteries and all this stuff. Um, you went from that to owning like a fleet of drones and doing agriculture stuff. So um, <laughs> talk about your transition into that. Like, how did that happen? So I did a couple creative uh, videography shoots for a couple local farmers. Um, and then I had a couple farmers, they asked me if I could do, we had a heavy rainstorm come through. A day or two later, they asked me, could you fly my field and show me where the saturation of the water is? Mm-hmm like show tile lines and where the water sits the most, see if they want to run another tile. What's and a I'm tile? Like, sure, why not? So I did that. And then. Hey, Chris, that came... real quick. What, just Go so ahead. we, just so that, you know, folks listening understand it. Yeah. And I'm not super familiar with farming either. When you say, did you say a tile line? Yeah. So like what clay is tile, is a tile they put in fields now, help with water irrigation. Oh, okay. So they put, does that so, like absorb the water or something? Well, the clay tile absorbs the water and they transport usually to like a, a ravine or a creek. Um, oh, okay. But they use a lot of plastic tile now. But so when it rains really heavily, you can actually see tile lines in the field. And that mm-hmm. it's really hard because the traditional way was just probing the ground like every foot to see where they stood. So I was going to farmer's fields and I was flying my Mavic. Yeah, I still have my Mavic Air 2 only at that time. I was just flying to see visually using an RGB camera where the most saturated water points were. And then two, where the tile lines, where the tile pattern um, was. Okay. So that kind of helped them save time. And for those that don't know how a farm functions or has never been around one, there's always something to do on a farm and there's usually not enough time. Mm-hmm. So, so you were able to help them do that. And then did right. that set off some ideas in your head? Like, Oh, I can, yeah, kind of, you know, what's the kickoff to this whole mapping, um, multi-spectral data collection for agriculture purposes. So in the winter I had some extra free time and I was, you know, doing some research. I'm like, Man, this the market in agriculture is still pretty traditional, at least in this part of Ohio. Yeah, and that's um, what I've heard for a lot of different places too. They've right now out west, it is starting to catch on pretty heavily. I know that the state of California actually has a uh, UAV or UAS aerial applicator test, where in Ohio we still um, 
UAV pilots still have to do the manned aircraft test. Mm. Um, so for for what? To, what's the, the applicator? Is that for like putting okay, spray yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff? Yeah. So um, aerial spraying, like spraying fungicides or pesticides, you have yeah. to get a license with the Department of Ag along with your commercial core. Um, oh. Oh, that's, that's like, what's kind of that's cool. what, like fly yeah. like crop dusters and stuff, right? Correct. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. So the one in California, they have a manned and unmanned test. Where in Ohio, oh. it's still um, a manned aircraft test for both. Gotcha. Um, so you were so you did that, and where did that? Where did your mind go? Or where what did you do after you kind of did that for those farmers? What were kind of the next steps that were leading you towards ag stuff? Um, so in the winter, I, I contacted a couple larger farm operations, um, south of us a little bit and asked them, and then I contacted some seed reps and asked them what their thoughts were. And by doing that, they said they were, they're interested and they've heard of it at like conventions or other places out West using it, but they don't fully understand its benefits. So I, mm -hmm. early in the spring, probably this February to March, I was um, just calling up farmers and saying like, you know, just educating them about what this can do for you. Um, mm -hmm. Plus two, with the uh, cost of um, operations so high for everybody, especially all the um, operation costs that farmers ensue regarding like diesel, Mm. fungicide right. pests, all that being all yeah, like all materials can, right all the cost of the yeah, materials and um you can greatly reduce that amount of cost of operations because using the multi-spectral data you can actually pull out certain information and like identify you know a weed patch or a troubled part of your soybean crop um and how would they traditionally identify that by just like driving around or something, or how would it, how would it normally work? Like a side by side or boots on the ground? And do they actively do a lot of farmers actively go like scout their field and crops looking for stuff like that? I think it depends on the farmer itself. Yeah. Um, that I yeah, but my point to them in that case is okay. Maybe you walk in fifteen rows in your cornfield when it's in V5 to V6, everything looks all okay. But what about the other 500 rows? Uh -huh. well, some could be damaged or there could be an issue with um, the crop developing that you don't know because you didn't walk out that far. You didn't have the time to. Uh -huh. So I told them, they're like, oh, that kind of makes sense. So I did some just visual RB, RGB flying with the Mavic 2 Zoom. I bought that back in last September um, and just did some more, kind of the same process I used for um, finding the tile line patterns. Uh -huh. I simply flew the fields I, um, with a basic mapping software just so I had like waypoints. Um, okay. So I flew those, I flew it at a certain height. And then if there was an area where the farmer was like, hey, what's that? I would go back to that spot and um, manual fly it, go down about 10 feet mm. so they could get a better idea Gotcha. of what was there. Yeah. And then at this point, were you still kind of just experimenting, seeing what was helpful for yeah. people or were you just, or were you charging for stuff at this time? Um, it was mainly just uh, seeing what people found beneficial. Yeah. Now, how did you go from doing that kind of stuff with a Mavic Air 2 to then getting like, an RTK drone and a sprayer drone and all that. I found that I was limited by how much I could do with the Mavic 2. Yeah. Um, rather quickly, I'm like, man, I was reading them like multi-spectral data in agriculture and I was reading through them like, I, I, I need that. Like mm -hmm. this could have helped so many farmers. So I bought, I just bought that back in in June. I bought that back towards the middle of May. Um, okay, so it's relatively new that you so it's still it. It's still quite fairly new. Oh, gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. So Is that on the RTK and the, the multi-spectral yes. stuff and the sprayer? No, you had mentioned that you had a uh, Phantom 4 RTK drone. I think you said right. that one had multi-spectral on it? 
Yeah, that one does. So and that's six the, cameras. Yeah, and then you had the um the sprayer drone. So were you saying you got both of those back in May? Yeah, middle of late May, I got both of those. Gotcha. Now okay. I can't use the spray drone yet because I'm still waiting to get all the paperwork done and the I's dot and T's crossed from the FAA. Gotcha. So that's currently just sitting in the shop um, gotcha. waiting for that. So now what's the process? It is, what it is there, but go ahead. Gotcha. I say, what's the process you have to go through with the FAA to be able to use a sprayer drone? So if you're using a sprayer drone that is under 55 pounds, you need a part 130 exemption. And then along with that, you need to obtain the proper licensure and insurance that is stated by the state you live in. So in the state of Ohio, you have the core, which is a commercial applicators test. You have to hold that license and then renew that every three years. Um, and then along with that, you have to take the aerial applicator test um, and then hold a um, insurance policy that meets the state's requirements. Upon doing so and they approve that, they will issue you a um, business certificate recognizing your business as an EOU applicator. Gotcha. That's a whole, so, a whole process. Now, what are these tests uh, comprised of? Uh, regarding what? Are they just all like, is it all just book tests? Or there's like, they watch, go out there and watch you fly a right. Great drone question. around or what? Gotcha. So for the state of Ohio, Department of Ag, Agriculture, they are solely worried about you fully understanding um, the pesticide and all the benefits, possible issues, along with being an aerial applicator. Now, the FAA, upon receiving my forms and waivers, I will have to perform a test flight for them, along really? with a yeah, along with a fifteen twenty infield question test. Um, that's basically like an overview of both. So waiting here on that. Um, and do they like, but I will have to do that. I'm assuming he hopefully within a month because I have people that want me to spray. Gotcha. So they'll, that sounds like a, sounds like a lot to go through. So you got to do two, it's is it quite a process. two state test. You said like an aerial applicator test and there was a core, right. what was the other one called? Commercial applicators. Oh, commercial applicators. Yeah. And then, and then after you get those, then you have to get. You said a part one thirty exemption with the FAA. One thirty seven. Part one thirty seven. Now, what is part one thirty seven? Yeah, for any spray you know? drone, no matter the weight, you have to obtain that. And then, since the T thirty is over fifty five pounds, mm. that makes it a whole other gamut. Um, yeah. You have to get a class two medical, um, certification, like a mandated craft pilot. Work. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to like go to a doctor register. and you have to like check you off that right. you can physically fit. It's a complete physical. Um, yeah. And then after that, you also need to. What was it? I forgot. Um, way. For me, yeah. That's... So either way, it's a, it's an involved process. Yeah. So then once you once you get all that stuff, then you're going to be able to go and load up your spray or drone with pesticides and treat crops right so you got pesticides fungicides herb all herbicides um now what's cool though about the t30 is that it has interchangeable tanks hmm. so once crops are off you can put down like cover crop which doesn't need drilled on the ground um usually, usually they'll just plant it like like not full in the ground. Um, gotcha. So you can do cover crop. You can do dry product too with the granular hopper. You could do uh, like a granular fertilizer um, and those type of products too. Or even, I don't see why it wouldn't work, but for like planting, planting grass, like mm -hmm. grass seed for like a mass area, hmm. I don't see why it wouldn't work. Because um, it's the same thing grass. as it's like walking along with the little Exactly, yeah. Yeah, out, yeah, like yeah. a real part that holds the grass seed. Yeah. And then I've been approached by an energy company in Ohio to possibly um, spray their solar fields. Now, this okay. is going to be a little bit different. So this would be using like cleaning solution 
to clean the dirt and grime off the solar panels. Mm. Interesting. Because I guess yes, you can really load anything in those sprayer tanks, right? Like any right. type as of long as they're clean, because if you run, Right. As long as you clean them, because if you run the pesticide, and this kind of applies to both this and the egg. If you run the pesticide in one field, in that tank, you have to clean out that tank three times before you can change sure. to a fungicide because you could damage that crop. Right. That. Yeah, you're flying for a fungicide. So the, thing, the same process would carry over for you know spraying solar fields. Um, yeah. Because you with the T30, you can cover about 45 acres an hour. Okay. And that holds, it's, about, it's a 30 liter tank, so that's roughly eight and a half, nine gallons um, of product you could carry. Man, that's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different options with the T30 besides agriculture. Yeah. Now, these the guys at the solar the solar farm, did they have anybody like were they using a regular manned aircraft to do this before? Or were they doing it by hand? Or they're not doing it at all. I think they were doing it by hand. They haven't come out and said yet. Oh, okay. And then, you know, I'm thinking, you know, with farmers and stuff, have you found like your pitch to them? Again, I don't know how much you've been able to pitch it so far since I know it's a new thing for you, but like. Uh, a traditional manned aircraft doing crop dusting versus your sprayer? Is it like, right? In your experience, is the crop duster kind of overkill because it's just hitting everything? Or what's the maybe walk us right. non farmers through kind of how you think about this? Yeah, that's a great point, Dave. So that's what's so cool about combining the multi spectral drone, the Phantom 4, with the T30. Um, because with the software, like PIX4D fields or drone deploy, um, I forget what their version is called, drone, de drone deploy for agriculture purposes, mm -hmm. you can pull a lot of different data. Even drone deploy right now has um, part of the software they can develop stand count estimates, mm -hmm. which helps farmers understand how many bushels per acre they will get, which gives them an estimate of how much money they'll take at harvest. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, but what's really interesting is with the multi-spectral data, you can fly a field and precisely apply using the T30, um, precisely apply the needed product. So there's a new, um, fungus coming in Ohio. It's up and coming. It's called tar. It's okay. like a brown spot on the leaf, um, uh -huh. on the tassel of field corn. So you use it by flying by flying first with the phantom, you can say, okay, you have a hundred acre field, twenty acres um of that field are damaged, the rest are fine. So this is where it, it defers from manned aircraft spraying to drone. You can properly identify what it is, you can reconfirm using an RGB camera, which is on the phantom. Right. Um and then you can actually export that area using DJI Terra agriculture mm. up to the T30. And then that T30 will fly to the spot where the boundary markers are set and only spray that area. And then within the software too, you can set like, I want a five foot boundary from the edge of the troubled area to the rest of the field. Right. Um, and all those little nitty gritty details you can do. And so for the T30, is it an automated flight and spraying? Right. So you can fly it manually. Um, then you have to manually spray. Or you can map. Like how you map a field now with a Mavic 2 mm -hmm. Pro or a Phantom. It's the same process. There's a couple of different steps that you would have to do to fly autonomously. Yeah. Um, but since it's DJI software, the interface is pretty fam um, similar. Yeah. That's really, really cool. And so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's, if there's damaged area, how would, how otherwise would they treat it if they weren't going to use a, a crop duster? Like, how do they spray it now without a drone sprayer? Well, you have crop dusters, and then you have boom sprayers. Boom now, sprayers? This is another, yeah, boom sprayers. So they're a big 60-foot, they cover a 60-foot swath, um, and they, they cover a lot of, area but the downfall to that is soil compaction or damage so when you're using a boom sprayer you're driving on the dirt which is fine but if you got crops in there and they're anywhere from v even ve which is just after it emerges from the ground okay up to r2 or r1 when it starts to turn brown 
So that's when the soybeans will start to die, the leaves fall off. Okay. Um, the corn will start to dry up. So if you're doing that and you're using a broom spray, you can possibly damage your, your crop, which will damage your your um profit margin. Right. And then so say it say it rains and they need to spray the day after it rains. They can't run a standard broom sprayer in that field. Mm. They're gonna call it ruts. And ruts is basically where the tire runs and it piles up the dirt on each side because it's right. too wet. Right. And then they could use what? an aerial applicator like a fanned aircraft, but maybe the whole field doesn't need it. Or maybe they know, they know exactly where they need to spray, so they don't want to use a blanket policy, which right. is what I'm referring to. Um, so, yeah, regarding like the manned aircraft versus so traditional methods for spraying versus drone, um, they both have – each of them have their purpose and where they fit the best. But the biggest benefit to using a drone – is it's going to be more precise, just like in other industries, like in uh, mapping, or now they're starting to really use them in surveying. They're a little bit more precise and or they're more efficient than tra traditional methods. Yeah. So where the, that said field, you know, they know exactly where the issue is. It rained, so they can't run the broom spur, but they don't want to use an aerial applicator via manned aircraft because they're going to be spending more money than they need to. Right. So I could go out that day, say they show me we need it here to this part of the field. I can pull that up, generate a map with the um, DJI Terra agriculture software, and then execute that map. And I can cover 45 acres an hour where a broom sprayer goes six, covers a 60 foot swath, and they only can go six, 10 miles an hour, mm. depending what stage the crop's in. Yeah. Now is a boom sprayer like literally like a like a vehicle that's riding through the the crops or is this so one of those tractor with two big arms on each side? Gotcha. And then a tank underneath. Gotcha, gotcha. And then I imagine is it expensive to get like a, a manned aircraft to fly and do um application or is that relatively inexpensive cons you know, like compared to the drone? So are you referring to like the actual pilot flying that? Yeah, like if a if a or, farmer was like, oh hey, I need to get farmer this. hiring a manned aircraft. What's that? Are you referring to the cost for the farmer or the cost for a pilot to do it? No, no, no. For the farmer, if they're like, oh, I need to get this, gotcha. this crop, this field sprayed with whatever, is that right. like for them, like their decision making, like oh, it's going to be the drones really a lot cheaper because it's less area, or is it? I don't. I just don't know how the costs right. shape up. Right. No, that makes sense. So at least in this part of Ohio, we price per acre. A manned aircraft aerial applicators are anywhere from fifteen to eighteen an acre. Okay. Um, I price myself in between that point, close to the end, lower end of that. Gotcha. Because I'm not. I'm going for precise application. Right. Where they're covering all of it. Um, right. And well, I don't want to be in the high end of that because then they will hire simply the manned aircraft right. pilot. Well, could let's say if it was like a smaller area, I don't know what a small area is. Let's say like one acre. They have a let's say they have a thousand acre field. Right. They right. want to apply it to one acre. Could a crop tester even hit one acre only? You know what I mean? I, I highly doubt it. Maybe a helicopter crop duster, but those aren't too popular in this area. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious, like what the options are as they're thinking about yeah. their decision making. You got to remember too, the airplane has to not have have enough space to come down, True. dispense the product, and then pull back up. Yeah, yeah. Um, where, we, where drones function more as a helicopter because they're roto a roto driven right right aircraft. That's really interesting. So they can be more precise. Yeah. Now, have you done any, you know, I know, I guess you, it's really new with the multispectral stuff. Have you started doing any work for farmers yet using the multispectral? Is that kind of, you're going to start using that whenever you can actually start using the sprayer? So I've done a little bit of work for myself on our farm. I have mm -hmm. not done any work for other farms yet. Yeah. Um, because I have farmers interested in spraying. Right. And then they want to be able to see the mapping with the spraying. So I'm kind of at this weird holding point right. waiting for all the paperwork to get signed. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Man, that's really cool. Well, man, we're hitting our uh, we're hitting our time limit here. It's coming close. 
I feel like I can ask you that more. real quick. I know. Um, well, I'll ask you a couple of quick, you know, wrap up questions. Um, sure. So obviously you've transitioned. That's pretty cool. That you had you were doing like real estate stuff, and it makes sense that you kind of switched to agriculture since that's yeah, your background. It was a, it was a natural break into the market. Yeah, and I feel like you know if other I know other people are interested in like oh I can do this for agriculture, but it seems that maybe to do it for agriculture you need to have some type of knowledge or experience. It's like you don't even know the specific problems that there are per se unless you. Right have some prior knowledge or you know some farmers or whatever what would you say to someone who's like hey i'm really interested in using my drones and helping farmers or in the agriculture industry uh, but i don't know much about farming right like a lot of stuff you're talking about like the different phases of the growth of the crops or when you were talking about the tile you know i was like what is all this stuff um so if if you were telling me if i was like hey grant i really want to get going to agriculture what should i do where should i start like what would you tell me I recommend to them to work on a farm, even for like just a summer. Like if the farmer needs summer help, yeah, work on the farm. You'll you'll get so much knowledge just on how farms operate, better understanding of crops, um, what it takes to care for and grow that said crop, um, mm-hmm. and then take that knowledge at the end of the summer, apply it to your drone, what you want to do for agriculture, and then in the winter ask the, that farmer you worked with in that summer to hey i want to do a field day for you do a demo show you what i can do to help you save money and time yep yeah um that's personally what i would recommend okay and at but, the end of the day for them is it all about like how much yield they're producing because that's how much money they're going to make right i think at the end of the day that's part of it um i think obviously yeah everybody wants to maximize their profit potential or yield potential in this case but i think too it saves them time and yeah. money and farmers miss out on a lot of family get-togethers mm. or just social activities because there's not enough time mm. so i want to be able to help farmers do those things by providing them that service to let them go to that dance recital that football game and just increase their overall profit potential as well. Yeah. No, I love that angle of kind of, hey, let me try to improve your quality of life too at the same right. time. You know, you right. can continue to keep your the same kind of crops you've been growing. So, um, no, that's really cool, man. Um, well, man, well, I feel like we'll have to have you back on once you get everything fired up and get your Yeah, I would, I would enjoy that maybe next year sometime. Yeah, yeah, and kind of see like how things have been going. Um, but yeah. either way, this has been super helpful for me in education. I don't know that we've had someone on right. here who has the depth of knowledge that you do about just kind of agriculture and working on farm stuff. So I think for those of people that are listening to the podcast, it'll be really helpful for them to get that perspective and understand right. how, I think one thing that's really important is if you're in any service business, you're serving a customer, the more you can understand about how your client thinks about things and what real problems they have, you know, like that's the key, you know? So if you don't really understand that and you come to a farmer like, Hey, I've got a drone. How can I help? They're going to be like, I don't know. How can you, you know? Um, right. So, you got to have that background, that knowledge of how, what would help them the most. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is hopefully a good kind of intro or baseline starter for people who are thinking about that. And um, so, yeah, so thanks for coming on to talk about it. I was going to say that if people are going to want to look you up or anything or find out more about you, where's a good, good place to either get a hold of you or learn about you so we're on facebook and we're on instagram um just search 19th uas precision and then we also have a website 19th uas precision.com um okay and there you can find more information about us and i'm a- i'm working on adding um the ability for farmers to book online so they okay. say they need to be flown they can use they can book a date time and we will be there to fly nice that's cool and real quick how did um how did you end up with the name 19th uas precision where's the 19 come from (laughs) yeah it's it's a different one for sure so i'm a real history nerd at heart okay um i love early um american history so 19th century Mm -hmm. um and then i actually started a company before this in college and that was called 19th designs um okay and it just kind of flow and I want to be able to carry the brand over to each part of the, each business. Gotcha. So yeah. What well, comes from you liking the 19th century history? 
right, right, right. Uh, that's cool. Super odd, but it makes people <laughs> makes it stick out. Yeah, and at least you can don't have any trouble getting domain names, right? Nineteenth US Precision. No, not at all. Not gonna. Not <laughs> nobody's clamoring after that one. Now, see, the UAS part is on aerial services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, awesome. So, if, you know, check out Grant's stuff, and we'll try to link all of your info up in uh, the show notes for people, and uh, if it's on our blog or, or in the YouTube video, that depending on how people are watching this. So, um, but yeah, Grant, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you, Dave. With firing right. up the sprayer Jones and, and getting your forty-five licenses that you need for that. All right. Thank you. All right. Take uh-huh. care, man. I hope you enjoyed that podcast with Grant. I loved it because we don't really have a ton of agriculture folks on the show. So it was really good to talk to him about that and have somebody who actually knew what they were talking about when it comes to agriculture, because they've lived it and done it. So I hope you enjoyed that. Before you go, I wanted to remind you, if you want some discounts on courses, we have like a secret link for podcast listeners. If you go to dronelaunchacademy.com slash D1K, I think, I think it's D1K. That should bring you to a page where it's got some discounts for courses listed there. So you can jump in a course or you can go to our Mavic Mini course, Mavic Mini 101, Mini 2 Mastery or Drones 101. Use the promo code podcast and it'll get you those courses for just $1. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Go there if you're interested in that. And because that's not listed anywhere, we don't publish it. We don't, it's not even indexable through Google. So you have to type it in to get to it. If you want to do that, check it out. If you're just enjoying the podcast, sweet. Sounds good. Hope to see you next week for episode six.